Okay, so at the end of part one, we uh, we well, we just missed me uh, soldering the uh, the regulator on there from uh, that was salvaged from the previous uh, board, um, and I've put off uh, soldering on uh, all of these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, resistor networks because I uh, I'm not a big fan of doing the resistor networks, and I put it off until the last possible minute. So today, resistor networks and. The other SMT little components, the, the LEDs there, are on the uh, uh, are the order of the day. So I've got my 4 by 10 k um, resistor networks here, but unfortunately I've only got five of them left. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm down to salvaging them again. Unfortunately I've got an old board here. Um, but uh, I can't remember where we got to with this board. This one was this is a two eight eight XL, but I've got a feeling it's broken. I think this this board basically uh, was the CPLD killer, and I've uh, I've nuked too many CPLDs, so I don't think the CPLD works properly, uh, which is why this board was abandoned. And I've used it for practicing removing through hole and all sorts of stuff. So this has got four resistor networks on it, so I intend to steal these uh, and then only use one. For the LEDs, I actually do have a, a full set of, or, or plenty of different coloured LEDs here, 0805 again, but this board, which was another test platform, uh, which was just actually doing a, um, trying to salvage this chip, because I managed to lock this chip, it's got the word lock written right there, uh, I managed to inadvertently lock this by uh, trying to program it with, uh, that one is a 144, so I was trying to program the 144 with a 288 bitstream by mistake, so that's locked. So I was trying to work out how to unlock it, can't do that, so um, I might as well nick the uh, the LEDs off here and apply them directly on there. Uh, sadly, that one doesn't have any resistor networks on it, so uh, let's get started on that first. And uh, by the way, that's uh, been soaking all night in the IPA. You can see it's a bit blotchy, it's not perfectly clean, but that's uh, a jolly sight better than how we. Uh, we left it yesterday. So I think the easiest thing to do is to get the uh, hot air station on this. And we'll go up to, say, I think 320 is probably... Uh, and apologies for background noise, obviously we've got the solder sucker and the, uh, uh, and the hot air going. I think at 320 is probably reasonable for this sort of uh, work. And we will uh, we'll see how quickly we can get these off. Okay, so what do we use the resistor networks for? Well, these ones are straight pull-ups. Uh, this one is also a pull-up. These are pull-ups on um, control uh, lines. Uh, these one, this one's a pull-ups on things such as the cache uh, um, inhibit, enable, the, these kind of, um, uh, the pins basically that we don't use on the 68000, uh, sorry, the 68030. This one is a pull-up on the optional pins at the back here. Uh, this is not the right board. Let's solve on for this one. Uh, yes, that's clearly not the right board. That's got headers on it. But they're in roughly the same location. So, uh, yeah, here we go. We've got pull-ups on... Uh, these are on the bus. These are on the bus. There we go. Sorry, yeah, no, it is a different design. So this is basically uh, 4, 8, 12, 16... These are the 16 data lines that are not connected to the Falcon, so don't have any pull-ups. So these are the D0 uh, to D15 pull-ups. Uh, D16 to D31 are all uh, connected to the Falcon, so they're pulled up internally. Um, and this one over here uh, is a pull-up for the option header, which is the same. And uh, this one here is just protection, actually. Um, I was worried that me plugging things in and out was causing that CPLD to blow up that we talked about a second ago. So I actually just put another um, resistor network in there to uh, give it a little bit of protection from um, me uh, jamming a, um, uh, a jumper on and off. Especially when the board's powered up. So, 
resist networks work uh, are soldered on broadly similarly to uh, the others, except we have to make sure that the uh, the four uh, different um, individual uh, sections of the uh, the network are not shorted. Now, the way that I've designed this, th these are four basically individual resistors bussed together. They're not bussed together, that's a long term. Um, just connected for um, in a single package. I do have some bust ones. Bust ones are different. One corner is uh, common, and then all the other outputs you get, uh, you know, maybe seven. Um, or in this case, it'd be, uh, yeah, it would be seven. You'd get seven uh, individual resistors and one common ground. More efficient, but that's actually uh, not what I've, what I've got on here. These are all um, basically one, two, three, four parallel resistors just. Uh, just attached together. So let's have a go with this. I'm going to do this one here, RM4 to start with. Let's see if I can get you in close enough to, uh, to actually see what's going on today. So I'll just try and position it centrally on the footprint. Then same same thing, take it down, then hold it down, reflow, turn it around, and with just the, the merest drip of uh, solder on the end of the iron, move it down that way. We hold it down and do the opposite side. And this needs a close visual inspection. Yeah, that's really not very straight, but I think that's probably fine connectivity wise. So what we'll do is we'll um, we'll buzz these out properly after the uh, after we've soldered them in. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and actually buzz those lines out. So again, continuity mode on the meter. And the nice thing here is that one side should all be on the plus five rail. And then if I switch to the actual ohms range, so we should be basically seeing 10 kilo ohms. So we want to be seeing 10 kilo ohms across each pin. So I can see where most of these go. 10k, 10k, 10k. Okay, open loop, okay. So I've got a bad, bad joint on that one, RM4. That was okay, that was okay. Yep, so that line there is failing. The other thing to quickly check is that we don't have there we go. We don't have less than 20k between any two, and we should have 20k between them all, basically all the data lines. Uh, 
and this one should again be open loop. Yep, so we've got one bad connection. So let's just reflow that. Maybe it's just too not straight enough. But I can just put a big enough blob on there and it'll, uh, it'll make a connection. So we're going from there to there. Now I'm seeing 10k. 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 So, yeah, that was sufficient. So the same for these ones, except this time over here, I'm going to be using uh, the new resistor networks. I really do have to start assembling a list of what I need. I'm running out of 100 nanofarad uh, caps as well. So last in terms of the, uh, the small SMD components is uh, the or are, I should say, the uh, LEDs. So this will be more of a case of uh, the same. We just, um, we're going to lift them off here. I'll come back to that board. We're going to lift them off this one. And we're going to transplant them, basically. And so the uh, easy trick is the uh, hot air again. Sorry about the upcoming noise. Let's give it a quick try with the uh, diode tester on the meter. So the diode tester is very similar to the continuity. Just tries to put, I think it's probably one and a half volts across it. So we're expecting that to be the cathode. There we go, red, yellow, green, blue, white. So that should be going to ground let's put it let's connect to the ground pin over here there we go yep so i think we have got our orientations correct and that is the right way around okay so a quick pause while we can consider our next steps uh, we've now completed all of the passives all of the the diodes, all of the, well, the regulator, basically all of the small footprint uh, SMD components, the resistor networks et al. Uh, we've got the CPLD on. So what do we need now as the minimum viable test bench? So we don't need RAM, we don't need ROM, we don't need an FPU, but we do clearly need an oscillator, and we clearly need our CPU socket, and we need our two header strips. So I think that really ought to be our next focus. Although I'm quite tempted to now power the board with five volts and see if we can speak to the, the CPLD. Having looked at it up close, now that it is uh, a little bit more cleaned up, I'm pretty happy with the pin situation. I don't see anything there of concern. Uh, is that a little short over there? No, I don't think so. That's just the way that the, uh, the light was shining. That's... Uh, between the, uh, the first and second pin on this end. Maybe I'll just beat that out again, but I think I, I think it's fine. That's my least well aligned side, but I don't see any shorts or any, uh, any missed connections there. So, uh, as I say, I'm tempted now to actually uh, power this up and see whether 
um, the programmer can speak to the chip. Right, so I've decided a bit of testing is probably a, a good idea. So what we have here is um, a, a red line connected up to a 5 volt in and the black to a uh, ground. Uh, so that's using an actual test point down there and that's clipped underneath the uh, supply line of the FPU socket. So we can just test that we're, uh, we're in the right places there. Uh, Going to put the... Uh, we're in continuity again over here. Uh, so that should be ground. And we'll try f uh, across the opposite side of the board. Where's ground? There we go. So that one's connected. Uh, we'll check for 5 volts. These don't quite clip on, but hold them in place. So this should be plus 5 to that test point there. That should be plus 5 to the power pin of the... Uh, the crystal here, I think, should be plus five. Is uh, is that the power there? No, that one. There we go. There's the plus five. So, what about to ground? Is it safe to ground? Yep. And is it safe to the three volt line? Yes, it's safe to the three volt line as well. So, hopefully, we shouldn't blow anything up. So, I'm going to switch to uh, voltage mode. And what we're going to do is attach this to our uh, bench supply, my very tiny Chinese bench supply. And we'll set it to deliver a very low level current. So I'm just going to clip these on here. So that's going to be ground. So there we go, 5 volts in. And um, what should we set it to? That's starting at 60 milliamps. I think probably we'll take it up. Uh, we'll take that up to 100, which I think should be plenty. Uh, okay, so with nothing attached, I'm just going to turn this on and see whether it, if it clips. If it clips, we'll turn it off. 92. To be honest, that's gone. That's a lot higher than I thought when all my LEDs came on. That's a bit more than I was expecting. I'm just going to do that again quickly. Mm, not a huge fan of that. My chip's not getting hot. That's more than I was expecting. I think let's do some uh, voltage measurements. Uh, so um, I'm going to have to... I can't get it all in shot at once, so I'm going to concentrate on the voltmeter, I think, here. So let's put our brightness back to normal. Okay, so here we go. Power's gone on. We're going to go from ground to 5 volts. And we see 4.8. Okay, we're going to go ground to 3.3. And we see 3.3. Okay, what I'm going to hope is that that's simply... It's not getting hot. That, that, that is simply um, because it's a, an empty uh, chip. So the obvious next stage is to attempt to read the chip and see whether it's talking to me. So I've got my knockoff Xilinx programmer here. I'm going to attach this to the, uh, the laptop. And I'm going to use the, uh, the Gadget UK164 trick, which is to put some headers on here and then just prop it up uh, so that it's, uh, it makes some contact. The idea is that these plug in gently here. The red cable is for 3.3, which is uh, the uh, that's the 3.3 cents line. That doesn't actually drive 3.3 in. That just checks that the uh, device is powered and that we get 3.3 out. And if that happens, we should see a green light on the on the programmer. So, what I mean by that is this LED up here should turn green. So if I, this one. So I'm just going to throw the switch again on that three point th uh, on that five volt supply. Okay, nine point two, and there we go. If I apply a bit of pressure, it goes green. So that's what I mean about having to. Sorry, that was out of shot. But that's what I meant about having to uh, 
for blasting pressure. I just had to just had to touch that there. Okay, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to get this all in a shot in one go. So what is, I'm going to bring up the laptop screen here, and we we're, uh, we're going to concentrate on the programmer. So this um, we're using the uh, the uh, XC3S progs. Can you focus? There we go. Uh, the XC3S progs uh, tool. Um, this, if I try and just check it now, there are no JTEC chain found, which uh, is to be expected. I haven't powered anything up. So all I'm going to do this is basically asking for the um, to detect the JTAG chain. So I'm going to apply that sideways pressure onto the uh, the thing here. I'm going to press the I'm going to press the button to turn the power on. The power is on. The light is green. I'm going to try and read the JTAG chain. And there we go. I'm going to turn it off again. We've got an XE9528XL. Perfect. That is what we're expecting to see. Uh, so I'm a bit concerned about the amount of power that that's drawing, but uh, I don't have a firmware to, uh, to flash onto it at the moment. So I think what we'll probably do is just forge ahead here. And what I'm going to have to uh, come up with is a, is a firmware that maybe just drives all the pins to uh, to ground or something like that, so that we uh, we see if these these or maybe we try and flash the LEDs or something like that. Um, obviously, I have the firmware from the revision um, the revision four board, but the pin assignments has changed, so I can't just flash that in case uh, there's something uh, that will fundamentally clash there. Um, so uh, I actually do need to do uh, some software or some firmware work before I can really flash that. Okay, so I've had a rummage through the um, the header jar again, and uh, this is what I think we need for uh, a minimum working uh, test bench. We've got ourselves uh, the two uh, female header strips. So that one is a, I think that's 50, is it two by 25? goes in there these are obviously custom uh, orders uh, and this is a uh, 30 I think a tube of 15 which goes on the data line side uh, we've got some around the sorry, everything around today. we've got some around the corner uh, headers which um, I'll actually break off and fit on there for the programming header uh, we've got this just happened to be the perfect size for the configuration uh, header block at the top there so that will go in I've got a couple of little uh, small ones I'll put I'll probably only fit there's a reset jumper there which is just nice when you're programming you can hold the whole system in, in reset while you're doing the programming so I might fit one of those uh, and of course the biggie is the uh, 68030 PGA socket uh, these if you buy them in bulk is about seven pounds if you buy them um, in onesies and twosies you might pay uh, up to twice that um, sellers come and go I couldn't give you a recommendation off the top of my head I always check the uh, the Exos store uh, as my first point of call but stock goes up and down it's, it's they're hard to source you can kind of make your own with um, by chopping you know individual header strips into pieces and I've seen people like take the pins out of those and, and put them into 3d printed uh, just think of it is that 3d printed I don't know that might be and put them into 3d printed sort of like templates um, not worth it, not worth it guys. It was 15 quid, 15 quid. But the problem I have is, well obviously they're through hole and if you get it wrong, desoldering that. Well, <laughs> I've tried one and uh, what have I done? Maybe half of this and it's still not anywhere close to coming out. <laughs> I mean, that's an absolute nightmare to desolder these things. That was just for experimentation. Although I would, obviously if I can, salvage them I'd like to. Uh, so I tend to go quite late in the build process with that. You know, if something else is messed up first, I, I just I won't commit to using one. Uh, but I think we're at the point where we want to be able to put a um, a device in. Ah, we're going to need a socket for our um, our oscillator. We don't technically need to bring it up with an oscillator. We can run off the system oscillator, obviously. But those sockets are uh, smaller and expensive, so there's no harm in, uh, in fitting one of those. Let me see if I've got one nearby not quite sure where I keep them there we go we've got some proper 
turn uh, turn pin ones there um, and we've got some cheapy uh, dual wipes I'm going to use the cheapy dual wipe just because obviously that's been built for um, the actual oscillator itself uh, the turn pin has too many pins so you have to chop the pins off whereas what you can do with these when you only obviously want to uh, the end and middle pins is uh, to push because they're cheap nonsense uh, you can just grab the pin you don't want and shove it out I better make sure I can find all those so that I don't short anything out. So there we go, you see, we've instantly made a, uh, <laughs> a, a dual oscillator footprint socket. Um, yeah, I know, that's not the best. Uh, I could, that's only six pins to desolder, so if I had to, I could replace that with a proper one. I suspect if I actually do the uh, the 40 megahertz um, oscillator down here, I might solder it direct on, because I don't think there's clearance if you put a socket in for that one. Okay, maybe let's start with that one first. All right, so I've said this on a number of occasions, but it's worth uh, repeating. My preferred um, tip for through hole is very different to my preferred tip for um, surface mount work. So I recommend the, the chisel tip here for um, through hole soldering. I and mean, your tastes may vary, but I find that this delivers a decent amount of heat to uh, to things that are uh, the size of um, at least 2.54 mil pitch pins um, it's probably a bit too big once you get smaller than that but my chisel tip is obviously enormous for, for drag soldering and you, you don't want to use that on uh, 254 mil stuff okay so let's get cracking Right, so forgive the background noise because the um, the fume extract has gone. Right, so normal stuff. We uh, we start with a goodly amount of uh, flux in the corners. A nice. Soldering eyes at 290 again. Nice blob on uh, on the tip. We make sure we're not touching the pin with our finger, otherwise we're going to get ourselves burned. And we'll just introduce one to the other. That's not that's not fixed but that just holds that in place while we now do it properly. So uh, in this occasion we'll be introducing a normal through hole technique, we'll just be introducing the, um, uh, what's the term, uh, introducing the solder uh, as we go. Because it's through hole, it spins around like a top. So we'll just look along the edge there, looking for any bent pins, and through 90 degrees, do the same. And uh, that looks in excellent condition to me. I don't remember where this particular one was sourced from, but it does look a decent quality one. Uh, so, uh, unusual pin layout, obviously, with the uh, the 68030 uh, intended to stop us uh, fitting this the wrong way around. So, in this particular case, you can see there's two pins on the inside here, uh, and that goes. Uh, if you look at the board, that's on the the north side, so it implies pin one is up here. Uh, I don't. Yeah, there's no pin one marking on this but it will only fit in one way around there we go it fits in there if we try to do that a different way around yep 
Nope. There we go. So, similar to before, we'll just get some uh, some flux on opposite corners. A nice big dob of solder. Holding it flat and there we go, anchoring it. That's nice and rigid. And here comes. Well, I think I might, I might get the board holder out. Okay, the board holder is out. My tip's nice and clean. It's time for the boring through hole montage. And you don't technically need to do it, but I'm going to introduce flux because. Big believer in more flux. Well, that wasn't too terrible, but look at the mess I've left. In fact, there might just be a one there that I need to reflow. Mm. Get a bit more on that, and there we go. Yes, that's an absolute mess. I think I'm going to have to pause for a second and uh, and mop some of that up. Right, that's going to need a good long soak, but I've got so much other soldering to do that I think it's all going to need a good long soak, and that will give me time to go and work on the uh, the test firmware. So what's next on our list of uh, through hole funs and fun and games? I think we'll uh, we'll start with the uh, uh, the data line connection which fits on there. So we're going to flip this around and more of the same. Okay, so that's our socket in place for the uh, the CPU here. That's our socket for the uh, the main oscillator. That's our two interface strips to the uh, the Falcon. Um, I'm going to do this reset quickly. Now, what's the point of that? You might ask. Well, no, um, genuinely, when you're programming, you 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 obviously don't want the uh, the computer. You probably shouldn't really be running the computer at the same time. But I do a lot of programming in situ, and obviously want to hold the computer and reset so that we're not fighting because this is controlling, you know, bus arbitration. And if this isn't doing its job because it's being programmed, then who knows what's going on? And we could be driving currents against each other. So um, what my trick is is to, to hold it and reset and just put a jumper on the reset line. Uh, so that's all that's for. This is just a a short handy way for me to do it, stick on a jumper, do the programming, and let go of the jumper. Obviously in a production uh, environment, if you're uh, only ever doing this once, damn it I've just dragged a load of solder across my interconnect. That is annoying, will that clean up? Uh, obviously in production environment, if you're only ever doing this once, then you probably wouldn't bother with this. Look at that. Oh, that's annoying. Too busy yakking. Okay, fortunately that's just picked off. Didn't want to damage that. Okay, uh, so again, that's uh, filthy, and much cleaning is going to be required. That's just a shortcut. 
Okay, so, uh, ah yes, we've got our headers over here still. Can I do away with the, uh, with the board holder yet? I'm not sure. So uh, these uh, these are configuration options. So what we've got here, um, closed is active. So we've got board disable, we've got flash disable, we've got option one and option two. Um, option one and option two are yet to be decided. What I've done in the past, for example, is alt ram disabled. Um, if you handy if you've got emitos, um, if you're booting normal tos, you just don't put a fast ram program in your auto folder and that's the job done. What I've also done is disabled um, high speed mode so it runs at, uh, at 16 megahertz of falcon clock. Mm. I'm not really sure anyone really wants that so I've just labeled an option one, option two and then whoever's uh, programming their firmware can decide what they want to do uh, in firmware and these are normally held high and then by closing this you're pulling them low. That's the, uh, that's the idea. And last but not least, we do need to program this somehow. Maybe we'll get rid of the board holder now. That's a rarely used item in my lab. Okay, so we have now a, a gargantuan level of goo on the uh, uh, on the bottom of our board here, on both sides of our board. So uh, this is going to have to go in for a bit of a soak in my IPA bath again, I think. Although one tip I heard uh, on the forums, and I have yet to try, so I'm going to give it a go now, is to give it a bit of a bathe in contact cleaner beforehand, just a bit of a, a spray down, uh, because apparently that helps get rid of it before it goes into the bath. Never tried it, thought I'd give it a go. So I've got some WD-40 contact cleaner here. This I think is quite an old can from, uh, might have been back in the Maplin days even. Uh, no, it's probably from RS or something like that. So what I'm going to do is, where it's pretty grimy, like for example on here, I'm going to just give it a spray down here. I'm going to get the, uh, get the anti-static brush on it, just to see what happens. I'm just trying to work it out from uh, between the pins. Well, hmm, don't know. Why? Uh, why don't we give it a go? Okay, so here we are back here. Um, I have gone through and converted uh, all of my pin mappings from the previous revision to this one. And I've wired it up and cleaned it up a bit and got rid of a lot of the, the gunk. The results from the contact cleaner test um, don't seem bad, actually. Uh, the, um, uh, the board seems pretty clean. I, I, I won't move it now, but actually it's, uh, it's not that terrible at all. It hasn't finished drying off yet, though. But, uh, right, so what I've got... Uh, we're back hooked up here, five volts in ground, um, with the programmer connected and the computer here to check the JTAD link. Now this is um, odd and slightly worrying. When I power it on now, five volts going in, lights are on, we're, we're actually only getting 0 0.02 amps. It's now down to t below 20 milliamps, and before it was, it was up at 92 milliamps. So um, that's a bit of a worry. I don't know whether all the gunk before from the uh, 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 the flux residue was actually causing a short, but now it seems to be running a lot lower power. It's got the green light on here, and I can read the the JTAG chain. So a little bit worried about that. Anyway, what I've done is I've built a version of my firmware uh, that is basically uh, identical to the old um, the old firmware. Uh, with the uh, the appropriate extra lines added and, and renames happened. And what I've done is I've just written it here to uh, to do a little bit of a binary counter on the LEDs to prove that we can uh, can drive them. So that's been compiled and is, is ready. So I'm going to try writing that now 
to the uh, um, to the CPLD and what we should see is if this works these will dim for a few seconds whilst it programs and then what we should end up with is a counter uh, with the, the white being the least significant and the red being the most significant bit so let's give that a go okay so programming is happening you see these actually you know it hasn't gone dim but the, the pattern has changed uh, it's drawing less current and verifying verification complete <laughs> oh dear and actually I'm going to power that off actually it's only jumped over 100 milliamps so there's potentially potentially we do have a short and my uh, my code is is powering two pins in opposite states and, and if they're shorted uh, then we'll see this. So that went to over 100 milliamps, so the voltage dropped. So what I'm going to try and do is actually take that to... I'm going to let it have 150 and see whether it stabilizes, and if not, I'm going to be checking for shorts again. So one more go. Okay, and that has gone to 141, but I don't have my LEDs. <laughs> uh, I've just realised what I've done. What a silly sausage! I'm basing this on a on a um, on an oscillator that that's that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. No wonder that doesn't work. Let's um, <laughs> let's see if I can find an oscillator. Okay. So I've got myself a 36 megahertz oscillator, which is ideal actually, because this is probably what we'll end up testing it with. Um, now, hopefully, we should see some results now on the uh, uh, on the LEDs here. So I'm powering that on again now. Ah, there we go. We've got our counter, and it's drawing now. It's drawing 160 milliamps. So that's that's not terrible, um, given it's now actually basically doing its full workload. There's nothing to work to, but it is basically going its full workload. Right. So we're seeing that flicker very quickly. That's very quick. That one is fairly high frequency. I would say that's something in the order of uh, of 10 a second. That's going to be, well, it'll be half that one. It's about five, and that'll be about two and a half times a second. Yeah, probably, maybe that's a bit more than 10. But there we go. That's kind of what we're expecting. What about if I uh, drop that frequency some more? Can we control this? There we go. Verification complete. And oh dear, I've overdone that. There's the binary counter. Wow. That was the multimeter. So there we go. Well, there's the binary counter running nicely. Bang. Right. So I think, to be honest, it's lukewarm. It's nothing. It's not getting hot or anything. So I think, to be honest, um, we should be quite happy with that. And it's probably time to actually move on to trying it in the Falcon and see whether we um, can boot the diagnostic cartridge. So, uh, oh, it's so close to filling all the lights. Let's fill all the lights. There we go. Next to the Falcon. Okay, so we've got the Falcon set up here. Um, just put a protective plastic cover over the, uh, the power supply. And here is the card that we've just built. What I've done is I've popped a plastic uh, 68,000... Uh, in, in there, it's got a little heat sink on it. Um, this is from a previous uh, card, the, the one I showed you earlier on. So I'll pop that in there. That's capable of running at 40 megahertz, so it should be fine for testing. I've got a 36 megahertz crystal in there, which again is absolutely fine. Um, and it's all just uh, set up at the moment, and I'm going to put this jumper on the disabled um, option uh, port there, switch. So uh, we basically should not be running our board. It should be booting now from the uh, the normal onboard 68030. Uh, no acceleration. This uh, will just test basically that um, the CPLD is asserting the right sig sim uh, signals, disabling all of my card and allowing the normal ST to boot. And we're going to use Exos's diagnostic multi-diagnostic cartridge here to um, to test uh, conventional boot up. So if you haven't seen one of these before, I'll just take you through what this is. This has got a half megabyte 
uh, ROM on here, the, the same type that the Falcon uses actually for its main ROM, and it's got a whole series of different diagnostic tools uh, for different systems on here. So this has got the standard ST diagnostic cartridge, the STE version, the Mega ST version, the TT version, the Falcon version, which we'll be using. It's also got a uh, copy runnable from the desktop of um, Christian Zietz is yet another Atari RAM tester software for the ST and also the TT variant there as well which supports um, uh, Alt RAM, TT RAM uh, and at the bottom we've got Genbench 6 which is uh, it's probably not the most recent version because this was bought some time ago, it's 2019 but that will, um, you know, it allows you to get access to Genbench quickly if you so need and it's configured with these various jumpers so we want the uh, 030 version, the uh, full conversion here. So that's uh, these two in a diagonal position, this one vertical and this one in the middle slot. So that should be correctly configured. Pop it in the cartridge port. Uh, my cartridge port's a little bit dodgy so if we just get a white screen um, we might have to reseat that. But we'll just pop that in the side there. I'm going to try, I don't think I can realistically get you get everything in I'm afraid so I shall try and get as much as I can Hopefully we'll see something appear on the screen, if uh, if it works. Okay, and I'd say, bear in mind it's just been a, a really short port. I'd say we've probably got a 50-50 chance if it um, if this comes up. Great, we can move on to the next step. But uh, we we probably not. I'm not going to be too disappointed if this doesn't work. I really haven't spent much time uh, setting up the firmware. It is just a direct port of the previous board. So uh, anyway, here we go. And uh, I'll get ready to turn it off quickly if anything starts getting too hot. So blue screen straight away. Uh, perfect. Okay, and uh, we've got so, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I wondered what the status LEDs were doing. They're still doing the uh, they're still doing the count that we uh, <laughs> that we set up before. Um, okay, so well <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, that's very good, actually. Right, so uh, that means that um, the onboard O3O 3 and the normal behaviour is, uh, is is working fine, and we haven't uh, we haven't got uh, well none of the important lines are shorted or anything like that. Bear in mind we're connected to all the address lines, all the data lines, uh, the bus request, the bus grant, the uh, the bus grant acknowledge, the halt line. Everything is basically being uh, administered from the CPLD. So nothing there seems to have been adversely affected so that's that's very good so i'm going to uh, take that off and uh, we're going to risk it for a biscuit um uh, what i do need to do is to jump at the flash disable line because uh, obviously we never sold any flash onto this i don't think i've actually got any left so i'll have to sell with some get some more but for now we don't need it it's optional it's if you want to have um, some onboard fast one a mutos or something like that rewritable as well obviously uh, okay let's give it another go so that's so now we should be enabled our board is enabled we should be running from this cpu we should be running with acceleration but there's obviously no memory alt ram and there's no flash so that's why we have to disable the flash there um, we don't need to do anything to disable the alt ram providing we don't run our um a mutos might might have problems but but if we boot from normal toss um, or the, the diagnostic cartridge, provided we don't ram, uh, run our fast RAM program, it won't know about it anyway. So that should be fine. So here we go, fingers crossed. Uh, if we had a 50-50 chance the last time, I'd say we probably have a, a one in... Yeah, I wonder when. One in five chance now. Although given that the last one worked, we've probably now got a, maybe a 30% chance. So, so let's see, fingers crossed, here we go. Still no sweat. Red, yes, okay, right. We're, I'm not too worried about the red screen. The red screen is because of slight difference in bus um, error behavior on the boot up. That, that normally happens. Uh, but that's great. That's, uh, that's got a lot. Uh, that's, that's really good. That's got a lot further than I dared to hope. Um, that's actually really good news. We can actually now, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to turn that straight off. We can, we can take that out and try booting to the desktop and uh, we'll see if we've uh, we can get to the desktop see if we've got any ex measurable acceleration that'll prove that it's this card and not the uh, and not the motherboard running let me uh, let me just tilt you up a bit so you can see the whole screen so we're hoping for 
Atari logo. Got the Atari logo. Will it? Will it read the hard disk? Yes, yes, good. Okay, and that's my um, NVRAM program. So we'll just reboot. Let it carry on through to uh, the desktop. One thing that might fail is is uh, Blitter. No, no, that's it's got that far. That's good. Okay. Uh, well, let's uh, let me bring you in a bit closer again. Then I don't think we need to watch the board anymore. Bring you in a bit closer, and we'll uh, we'll try some diagnostics. Okay, so first things first is to look at uh, what well, Gem Bench. Uh, I would have thought. Uh, let's test the integer division. So the integer division should um, 36 megahertz. We should be looking at something like 200 and what's that? 220 uh, percent. Um, 24. Bang. So perfect. We are running from our newly built card. We've got an accelerator. That's it. We have built an accelerator. And I think that's an excellent time to draw part two to a close and in part three we will look forward to uh, installing some of the optional components and I think number one on that list is going to be the alt ram. Let's try and get our alt ram set up and working and see what kind of performance we can get out of the machine then. Thank you very much for watching, see you in part three.